Welcome to our first virtual organic field day of the year for AgriSecure. Uh, we're really glad that you could join us and, and appreciate you taking the time to, to spend uh, a few hours of the morning with us. Uh, my name is Steve Sinkula and I'm the CEO of AgriSecure um, and one of the co-founders of AgriSecure. And although it's unfortunate that we can't be together in the field together, uh, looking at crops and talking about what's happening in a specific stand or field right now. As we started to put this together, the AgriSecure team realized that uh, we had an opportunity that we wouldn't have uh, at, at previous uh, field days where we can look at more crops across a few more regions of the country and over multiple years. So this was really a unique opportunity and we're really excited about the discussion today. One of the keys to make it uh, something that's really robust and interesting is to get your questions. So uh, one of the things I really want to encourage is for you to ask questions throughout. And uh, I have muted everyone to minimize background noise. I think we've all been on a Zoom call where somebody didn't realize that they weren't uh, muted and uh, there's something pretty loud going on in the background. So there's a few ways that you can participate by asking questions. One is there's a Q&A box uh, on the control panel for Zoom. If you enter in a question, I will watch for those and try to integrate them into the discussion at an appropriate time. The other thing you can do is I believe there's a little raise hand, so a hand icon. If you raise your hand, I'll watch out for that. And at a break pretty close to when you raise your hand, I'll uh, try to unmute you and then uh, uh, see if we can't get the, the, your question answered. Um, so uh, that's going to for the logistics. For those of you who haven't met AgriSecure before, I just do want to say a few things about us. So AgriSecure was founded by farmers, for, uh, which are organic farmers for farmers. Our mission is really to help our members be more successful. And that can be wherever they are in their organic journey, whether they're starting their transition or have many years of experience on organics. What we try to do is take what we think we're good at and help bring that to organic farms. And really what we do and in, in, in focus in on is sharing our organic knowledge and continuing, continually leveraging our own farms and our network of members to build and disseminate new insights and practices. And today is one of those things where we're gonna share a little bit more publicly what we've seen in the field this year and some things that we've been thinking about, but also again, having that conversation so everybody can benefit from it. Uh, we deliver the platform, uh, platform and approach and support to enhance farm planning and execution. And for those of you who are in organic farming, you understand how critical execution is. Uh, we deliver, uh, we, we, our platform can also help uh, eliminate uh, or reduce a lot of the time, effort, and frustrations uh, associated with certification. And this year that's proven really, uh, I think, valuable for our members. With COVID happening, a lot has been unknown and changing in that certification landscape. And I'm really proud of how our team has helped our members navigate that. And then finally, we can help our members understand uh, what's happening in the organic market and how to manage their risk while pursuing the best potential uh, revenue outcomes with our organic grain marketing program. So if you'd like to learn more about what we do, uh, feel free to reach out to me or to anyone on the team. There's plenty of ways you can go to agrisecure.com and reach out from there or follow up on one of the emails that you received about this event and we'd be happy to talk with you. So today's agenda, we're going to be talking about crops and techniques that make organic rotation successful over the long term. So we'll be talking about alfalfa, small grains, and intercropping. While these crops may not get all the headlines around organics uh, because they don't have the, the revenue potential of organic corn, they're absolutely critical for success, in our opinion, for organic crops. Uh, and so we'll be talking through those in that order from an agenda perspective. And again, we'll have time for Q&A at the end, but also be asking for questions throughout. Fortunately, we have a really wonderful team at AgriSecure and we'll be hearing from three of the members beyond myself. So Bryce Orlbeck, who's a co-founder and fifth generation farmer uh, and owner of b, &B Earlbeck Farms. Amy Bruck, 
co-founder and organic farmer, uh, owner of Cyclone Farms in York, Nebraska, and Ken Jenkins, uh, an account executive with AgriSecure, and a first-generation organic farmer uh, with Goliath Ag. Uh, I want you to put their knowledge to the test, so ask the hard questions. Uh, don't feel, feel free not to hold back on them. And before we kick off, uh, just wanna take a, take a stock on why are we here today? Um, uh, and so from my perspective, we're here today because organic is a compelling opportunity. Whether you, you're organic already or just learning about it, um, there's something about it that's compelling from a profit perspective and other aspects that uh, you might find compelling. But it isn't easy. Um, and at AgriSecure, we believe that one of the keys to success uh, over the long term is having the right rotation. And those rotations require diversity. And so uh, part of that is incorporating crops such as alfalfa or small grains, or looking at new practices like intercropping to help make sure that we have that right rotation. And when we're talking about diversity and rotation, we're talking obviously about the crop and what that crop might bring to weed management or soil health, but we're also talking about diversity in timing of activities to allow you to really make sure that you can be excellent at executing every crop in every field across your operation so that uh, you can have the best chance at success. And this is uh, extremely important as in times like now where uh, prices are depressed a little bit and operational excellence is going to be a, even more of a premium where you can manage your expenses and get the most out of the field that you can. So with that, we're going to jump into alfalfa and I'm going to hand it over to Bryce Earlbeck. Bryce? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Bryce Earlbeck here, co-founder of AgriSecure and Farmer in West Central Iowa. Uh, we'll start the day off with alfalfa and organics. And notice we didn't say organic alfalfa because we'll switch back and forth from transition to organic alfalfa to conventional alfalfa. Uh, alfalfa has been an integral part in our farm in Western Iowa, B&B Earlbeck Farms, as well as an integral part to successful organic operations I've seen and worked with around the country. And we'll dive into a little bit of why that is and the, the economics behind it in the next few slides as we move forward. And I know we'll have a video that comes up right before we dive into that, Keith, so I'll let you play that here. In our organic rotation, we figured that we don't want to take that spring seed and hit. We grow corn, then we grow a canola mix, and then we fall seed alfalfa. It gives us two years of alfalfa for a week and throw it back to corn. And we've really eliminated that huge hit you take the first year in alfalfa because we're not spring seeding it. We get about 80 90% of the production that first year that alfalfa is uh, coming up after the fall seed. In our organic. Oop. Just one thing about the video real quick. Uh, we do have longer, a longer set of videos uh, that we'll be posting on YouTube sometime in the near future. So we'll be letting you, uh, we'll be sharing that information with everyone on the call so you have an opportunity to see more about what's happening on Bryce's farm. Thank you, Steve. And so this is the, in this slide, we'll talk about transition alfalfa. Uh, through the last five years, we've transitioned about Two to 3,000 acres uh, and we've tried many different avenues to do that transition and we finally landed on uh, alfalfa as being the best avenue for our farm in west central Iowa. This farm is 70 acres, it's a silty loam. Uh, we started out with oats and alfalfa, oats is a cover crop in 18, 19 it's uh, an alfalfa again and 20 it will be uh, organic corn and we left some of the alfalfa in as well. We didn't turn it all to organic corn so we, we even get into the rotation when an organic corn or organic is possible that we'll leave alfalfa in for next year in that transition to do three years of transition uh, just because of our alfalfa markets that are close to us. When we transition, our yield goal is about 80 bushel oats, and that's exactly what we did this year. And one to one and a half ton of straw, the straw is hit and miss. Some years you'll have really good straw, some years it'll be a little less. And then we'll take a cutting off in the fall of one to one and a half tons of alfalfa 
This year will probably be closer to that one ton with our dry, our dry, uh, dry, not having our lack of moisture in our area during the year. And then that years two and three, we'll look at five to six tons or five and a half to six tons of alfalfa. So in the next couple of slides, we'll walk through what that means uh, as, as well as walk through the year of what, what went on in this field. So we look at transition alfalfa. This is June 29, 2020. Uh, as you can see, we're cutting that alfalfa, and one of the great things about alfalfa, we're cutting it four to five times a year, cut those new flush of weeds out, as well as build organic nitrogen into the soil. So it's doing two things that are probably uh, are the hardest aspects of organic farming, take care of weeds and get nitrogen into the soil. Uh, one of the things that you see on the right here is the picture, and below it is the things that we think about when we, do, when we have alfalfa production on our farms. The alfalfa markets vary by region. Uh, you have the, the feeder grinder hay markets, you have the square bill markets, and you have the dairy markets, and those vary by region, region by region and farm by farm. One of the other things that we do on our farm since we're shooting for dairy quality hay uh, is cutting and harvest timeliness is required to put up good alfalfa. Uh, equipment and planning are essential. We spent quite a bit of capital on good equipment to put up dairy quality hay. Uh, we do all, almost all wet hay, uh, and those markets require uh, large investments to be able to successfully enter those. If we look at a field plan budget here for transition alfalfa, we look at year one and year two. In year one, it's the establishment year, so we're drilling. We have an upfront cost. We expect to lose 100 to $200 that first year during organic uh, transition or during organic production when we go back into our alfalfa rotation. So we look at a total revenue on the first year, $455. Our gross income without rent figured in about $60 an acre. Those, that's one of the things that growers have to understand when doing this transition is you are going to have a loss in that first year of establishing that alfalfa. What we've seen is that second year you break even, that third year you can make money off of alfalfa. So if we dive into that second year, we're applying nutrients. We don't have the seed cost. Uh, we are harvesting it four to five times a year. And we're expecting a total revenue using grinder quality hay at $130 a ton of $650 of revenue or gross income of $315 an acre. So you're really looking at that third year of alfalfa to be profitable if you leave it in or break even over two years and having the good agronomic practices behind this, providing that we control, providing less chance of having mistakes during transition that would hinder the organic production in year three, and giving you that best possible chance for successful organic corn is why we do alfalfa, why we recommend it wherever possible uh, in, in, or with our AgriSecure members. So I will turn it over to Ken as he has been working with AgriSecure and his AE in North Central Iowa. Uh, he has the same da data, seeing the same thing as us, and on his farm that he started, he also chose to transition with alfalfa and oats. Uh, I will turn it over to him and let him talk through that now. Thanks, Bryce. Uh, as Bryce mentioned, my name is Ken Jenkins. I'm an account executive in North Central Iowa, covering the, the eastern part of the Midwest. Um, and our organic farm uh, is not fully organic yet, and we still have a few fields to transition. And this field in particular is in Thornton, Iowa, and it's 53 acres of, uh, of clay loam soil. It's a little bit heavier on the clay side, so drainage can be an issue from time to time. Um, consistently with corn, soybean rotation on the conventional side, and um, we've had some heavy weed pressure, so for us it was how do we make a transition to to make it more successful when we do hit the organic year and that's why we chose alfalfa and the oats our target for oats was about 70 bushel oats um, we the first year cutting of alfalfa we may or may not get we don't we weren't really planning on it hopefully there's enough straw there uh, to make up for it but then the bulk of our uh, cost will or in the front in the first year and then are made up with uh, the second year of transition for the alfalfa so if we go to the, the uh 
the next slide, I'll show, we'll talk a little bit about what we did here. So we planted this, uh, this field on April 11th, uh, or April 10th, and then had one pass, uh, just a nice drag pass behind it, and we got a really good stand out of it. And so again, previously this was uh, soybeans with a terrible herbicide control because we, we got it on late, our timing was poor. Um, by the time we realized that we hadn't gotten our post on there, it, it was kind of out of control. So, so we didn't get the weed control that we had liked. And that's again, why we chose to do what we did here. But it also is the reason that I'll point out is why we, we put our conventional acres into our my farm, farm platform too is just to make sure that we're accounting for all of our activities, even the things that aren't as front of mind, um, like the conventional, since we put a heavier focus on our organics at our farm. Uh, but what you'll see is that the oats will emerge prior to the alfalfa. Uh, for me, not raising alfalfa, it was a little bit nerve wracking, but it, you know, once you start to see this beautiful stand come up, you, you start to get put at ease. And then, for you can't really tell in this picture but we had really good weed control up front and on this next slide you'll see a little bit better so on the left we're starting to see our our alfalfa come in um, you're not really seeing a whole lot of weed pressure it's done a great job at choking out all the weeds the oats kind of took off and, and got ahead of the alfalfa so and established beforehand so that did a great job competing against the weeds um, we see a little bit of what we believe is just the alfalfa showing signs from a lack of uh, sunlight, but after we take those oats off, that should uh, kind of go away and then we should see the alfalfa fill in a little bit more. On the right hand side, you can see we've got a lot of CRP ground um, around this field, so it's hard to sometimes distinguish between what's a, a low spot and what's, you know, some sort of grass patch or something, but Usually you would have not been able to see this anything in this field because it would have just been out of control with button weeds and all sorts of other uh, MERS tail and things like that. So early on in the season, we had a few MERS tail, but uh, for the most part, it's done really well. And it, we've gotten our yield updates as of yesterday. And, you know, initially we thought we were going to have 70 bushel uh, oats out there. And it turns out that this was just the perfect year for small grains. And we're looking at 80 with some better test weight. So that was kind of a nice um, unexpected win for us. Uh, but again, to me, the transition part was more about making sure that we had the good weed suppression because that's what I was most nervous about with this field history. So then if we look at the cost, um, for us, we did do a plowing on that field just because again, you know, there was a lot of troubles that we had. Um, we did have a tractor get stuck in there last year putting on manure. Uh, and created some ruts. So we plowed this field and the difference that we saw on this and our organic field, which we have some oats and alfalfa um, first year on as well, is that the weed control was better. Um, we typically try not to do the plow at all. It's just, uh, but in this case, it actually benefited us uh, this year. So then we had the fuel cultivating and then we uh, did the drilling and the very next day, April 11th, we had uh, a quick drag pass and then we just kind of sat on that for a while. So you see we have about $192 in expenses, excluding rent. Um, we can adjust that 70 bushels, but you know, based on the yield estimate of 70 bushels and um, the potential for that alfalfa cutting, we're right around $355 of revenue. So the gross income is 162, but if you take out that alfalfa cutting, we're, we're close to about 43 bucks an acre. Then you factor in the rent, um, it'll be a loss this year on those acres, but we'll make that up in year two. As you see, our costs are a little bit lower for cutting and baling just because we have that equipment um, and it's fairly cheap for us to run. And so then with that, you know, we'll generate around four and a half to five tons, hopefully. And, uh, you know, we're hoping to sell it for 120 bucks because to me, I, I just want to get through this transition more than uh try and make tons and tons of money off of alfalfa but again if you notice the difference the gross income um we'll, we'll do a lot better out in uh, year two and that'll make up for some of the lost uh revenue on from year one so i'm gonna um, 
Before we get into the pros and cons, we've had a few questions and Bryce and, and Ken, I'll let you answer. Uh, so we had one from Adam Cook. Uh, was there manure cost for the oats too? And so Adam, I will answer first on mine. Uh, I came after soybeans on one of my oats fields this year that I didn't manure and did 80 bushel oats. Uh, the year before we came before corn on one of our fields and we did put a ton of manure on, we figure in about $45 per ton hauled and applied on, on oats cost. Ken, I'll let you talk on your field if you applied any manure. Yeah, so for us, um, and one thing I'll state is for everybody that their manure cost is going to be a little bit different just because of location, source, and trucking and all of those factors. So we get our manure a little bit cheaper just because we're kind of central to a lot of those sites. We didn't put any on before the oats. And the reason being, this is the year prior, we put on six tons of manure because um, we thought we were buying a less lesser quality and we ended up getting a really good quality manure out there. So we just did, we didn't need to put any more uh, nutrients out there because, you know, one of my other fears being a soils person is that we overload with uh, phosphorus. So we didn't put anything out in front of the oats and, you know, similar to Bryce, we got 80 bushel loads. So we're very happy with that. It, and just to confirm, it's more, I mean, it, it's a conscious decision not to over apply manure to oats. Uh, just, I don't feel comfortable on my farm doing it for the fact I don't want my oats laying down. I'd rather have a little less yield right now learning and I'll move the manure up as we learn going forward. Uh, it's a conscious decision not to do that uh, for harvestability. Um, yep, uh, Bryce, we've also had a few other questions on, uh, on fertility, uh, specifically on your slide and I'll go back, uh, to your, to your piece. You had the second dry spreading and there was a few questions around, uh, what was the product that you applied and maybe you can provide a little bit of background on why you applied it as well. Yeah, and I think that's a good talking point, Steve, that we haven't hit on yet during alfalfa is alfalfa takes quite a bit of nutrients out of the ground. And, and specifically, our alfalfa yields take anywhere from four to 500 pounds of potassium out of the ground. It's a, the real meaningful nutrient in, in the rotation. Phosphorus is not a big deal. Uh, we still have to replace it, but it's not, it's not at that level. Uh, the, the other nutrients can be replaced. And so talking through a little bit of our nutrient plan and answering the question while giving an overview of that, uh, that $24 is for calcium sulfate. We put about 200 to 250 pounds of calcium on our SO4 from calcium products. Uh, we do it for two reasons, to feed that crop of alfalfa, calcium and sulfur. We feel it raises the RFQ or RFB relative feed value for the dairy. It also benefits the soil by opening up the soil Calcium is the biggest particle that you find in the soil. So it really, it works into that soil long-term and opens it up, allows air water through it, especially in alfalfa, we're driving across it more than regular corn soybean fields. So we apply every field every year, 150 to 250 pounds of calcium across our entire farm, corn, soybean, small grains, alfalfa, pasture. Uh, we, we really like it. And so that's where that $24 comes from. Uh, the solid manure spreading, uh, that's what we spent this year is 80 bucks, and that was two tons of chicken manure. We're moving more to around 100 to $120 uh, just because of our markets where our hay is going. We can afford to do that, put it back. But we're looking at composted cattle manure with a lot more P and K. Uh, and right now I'm in the in the – Right now I'm working through that math of whether you use composted cattle manure or to buy in organic potassium sulfate to replace that P or that potassium four or 500 pounds. So you really got to consider your manure sources, what you're taking out of the ground. If you, if you have really expensive manure, alfalfa can be really hard to keep up with in the long run. Thanks Bryce. Uh, we also had a few questions around uh, the costs, and so let me clarify one first, or the, the economics or the financials we'll show you. So we have gross income uh, here, and I know that this is probably not the exact right term, 
what we've decided to do on many of the slides is to eliminate rent because rent can vary uh, from operation to operation. So by gross income, we, we primarily mean income before rent uh, and you know, other, over, other overhead like uh, interest or something like that. So it's really just to get to a pre-rent income. Um, and then the other question uh, that we had, either for Bryce or Ken, uh, was what's the source of our field operation costs? Yes, and so when I talk about B&B or Obec Farms, we hire a lot of stuff done. Uh, so we use Iowa State uh, operational costs that they put together. I know Ken does a lot of it on his own with the within the farm, so his are go going to be a little less, but we hire a significant portion of our operations done and we pay custom operation prices, so mine are going to be quite a bit higher. And if we don't hire it done, we still use Iowa State prices when we figure our budget. Uh, and, and then Bryce, do you wanna just talk a little bit about um, how we can, well, how we work with clients to uh, track their expenses uh, and, and understand their economics uh, on their organic fields briefly? Yes, yes, and that's the, the good thing about our system is, is you can tailor it to your farm, how you think about your costs and your expenses, and we can help you think through that. And just for lack of time and, and screen space, we, we put expenses up here in, in buckets where in our system, I'm breaking out, cutting, baling, picking up bales, hauling each, each cutting out of the field. And I can keep track of each of those expenses separately and uh, attach the, the cost of doing that uh, per cutting or, or pass per field of corn and attach my own expenses to that. So in the AgriSecure system, it really tailors to that farm and how you look at expenses, which every, not everybody, but there's, it varies quite significantly how people account for those expenses in their own operation. And we allow you to do that within the, within the AgriSecure My Farm platform. Um, one more question, Bryce, and then we'll get, uh, actually I'm gonna hold off on this one um, for the, the small grain section. So All right. let's move on to the, the kind of the key takeaways for alfalfa. Yeah. So as we talked about earlier, alfalfa has been an uh, integral part in, in a lot of operations. And thinking about the pros of alfalfa, uh, at, as from the standpoint of starting first organic or first transition, there's a very minimal risk, a very minimal chance for failure when planting alfalfa. There's ways to minimize risk through insurance. Uh, but you're not going to have disasters. You're not going to have weed banks grow during transition. Uh, you're going to have weed control through those four to five cuttings per year, taking out weeds, putting nitrogen into the ground through the fertility added by the alfalfa. Uh, you're not, as Ken talked about and I talked about, you're not going to be wildly profitable with alfalfa, but I don't think we are conventional corn or soybeans either. Uh, so the, the pros long-term uh, doing this with alfalfa and and we understand that not everybody can lose 100 to 200 dollars an acre the first year uh, but long term the the pros outweigh the cons for our farming operation in western iowa it delivers that great foundation for first year organic production assuming you can manage alfalfa and you have a market for it it also not just in transition we do a, we do three years of alfalfa every six years for organic organic rotation for the sustainable long term of our B and B Eurobex farms and the agronomic benefits. We we feel three out of six years for us is is appropriate. And walking you through our rotation is three years of row crop, three years of alfalfa. Most of our corn is cultivated once and rotary, rotary hoed once, cultivated once and we have very minimal re uh, weed pressure and we've cut down our, our manure applications and really cut the cost of our organic corn pretty significantly low having alfalfa in that rotation. If we look at the cons, uh, again that upfront investment in year one 
as can't be done by everybody in their financial situation. Uh, complex harvest logistics, I can tell you we've invested a lot of money into that in our farm. The con it's a decision we had to make up front. Uh, it, paying equipment is not cheap and most people do not have it. Uh, equipment investment is a must and markets regionally based. We put two to three years in building our markets. Not going to happen overnight. You're not going to call your local elevator and say, I want to sell off alpha. I think we know that. Uh, we've worked hard to build our markets. We've we put together plans and we put together processes and we've worked with end users and and we've invested quite a bit of money into getting where we're at uh, to, to make that a successful hay operation. And so it, it, it'll take time, it'll take money and it'll take management to, to bring that uh, alfalfa market to you. With that, I see we have a few questions, but I think I'm going to hold off on them for now, as I mentioned, but any other questions related to uh, alfalfa? <laughs> so, all right, then let's move into small grains. Bryce? Yeah. So, Small grains, we'll take the next about 20, 30 minutes to go through small grains, what we've learned this year from the different farms around the country that we work with, including our, my own. And, and we'll talk through, as we know, everybody can't raise alfalfa. Uh, small grains is the next best option for, as, a, as the overall arching uh, summary of what we're doing today is how to, how to bring longevity to an organic farm and bring uh, better financial outcome to that organic farm and, and decreasing the workload. And small grains is one of those areas that we, we can focus on and bring light to the financials and the agronomy behind it. If we look at small grains, there's a few things we learned about barley, oats, and rye. And, and it, seems, it seems like it's obvious these types of learnings, but until you raise them, until you learn how to do them, and it takes couple of years to learn this. Uh, we're on our fifth year of raising small grains and we've raised all of these on a on scale. And we still are learning things every year of how to raise these, how to get better. But if we look at them from a market standpoint, barley, oats, rye, and wheat, we see in transition, barley has one of the, the, the lowest market potentials. Uh, I really like it to feed, feed uh, beef cattle, but a lot of people don't understand barley especially cattle feeders. Uh, so as a very low potential on transition markets where we, there's open markets across the Midwest for transition wheat. Uh, you can get it sold, you can move it tomorrow for the most part if you look around. So we think about things of, of what is the market potential for them. And then we look at organic, which is a little bit different. Barley has high market potential. Uh, it is a replacement for corn in, in, in the organic market. And people that feed organic livestock understand barley a little bit better than the conventional guys. And we look at wheat having the highest potential of organic. It, it can be moved tomorrow. There's quite a few buyers of it, food and feed grade wheat. And with the lowest potential, we look at rye. Rye is very hard to move organically. We know of a few markets, but it's not a widespread market. We wouldn't grow it or suggest growing it without having a uh, offtake agreed upon. We look at weed management as it varies through the, the production. Uh, we raised quite a bit of barley this year. The weed management is pretty good. Uh, oats, it's not bad weed management, but it's just on the lower end of weed management that uh, we have seen. And so we look at rye as having the best weed management or keeping the weeds down uh, with the, the most success. And then the big part of all these small grains that we've learned, we've learned about in the Midwest is disease resistance. Uh, while wheat has really good markets, fairly good uh, weed management, disease resistance is, is, has been an issue throughout AgriSecure's or AgriSecure's producers, including my own farm. Uh, vomitoxins have been a huge issue. If you have too much rain and heat, you're going to you're going to have disease in wheat, and it's going to kick you out of a lot of markets uh, entirely, or deductions that make it not worth raising wheat. And so we look at barley having good, good disease resistance. The market's barley is going in in the Midwest. 
allow you to have a little disease in them and still make them useful and worth the worth the the, the purchase price. And then we look at oats and rye in the middle. Oats, we have the the test weight issues that we find in the Midwest. This year, we've actually had good test weights. But looking at a 10-year average year over year, you're going to have quite a few years that the, the test weight uh, kicks you out of a few markets. And rye as well has the same vomit toxin ability as wheat. And so we look at that disease resistance uh, of having risk behind it. So, so Bryce, one question we did get in the alfalfa section that I pushed for this is around alfalfa, uh, around oat markets. Um, the question was, you know, are you having trouble finding markets for oats? They seem very scarce. What are oats being used for by buyers? Yes, and so oats are not as widely marketable as corn and soybeans. I think that uh, everybody understands that, but we are seeing more and more oat markets pop up in the Midwest. Uh, we see more people feeding oats. And one of the reasons behind that is the good work of, uh, of people such as practical farmers that are building these markets for small grains. Uh, transitional oats, we we've, haven't had a problem selling that. Uh, there are, the market uh, liquidity is pretty good. Uh, now it depends year to year if you have 30, 30 pound test rate or below, it's a little bit more difficult to move. But I would say the, the oat market for transition is pretty good due to the fact of the hard work of uh, groups of people such as practical farmers. Uh, the organic market, a little bit tougher because if you don't hit food grade organic oats, you're going to most likely going to sell into the conventional market uh, for feed grade oats as there's not very many feed grade markets for organic. So, Recapping the oats, transition, uh, pretty good markets, organic, you have to hit that 36 test weight and above to, to really have access to, to markets and organic. Thanks, Bryce. All right. So one of the things that we grew on our farm this year uh, is barley, 55 acres, uh, came after transition rye, so we had transition barley, and we we ended up bailing it because of the transitional market was not there. So we bailed it and got two and a half tons per acre, came back and put a, a 10 way species cover crop mix on it to get it ready for organic corn next year. Uh, it's one of the things that we feel is, is on our farm that we wanted to learn more about it uh, during transition because we believe we're going to grow it more in organic. So we'll jump into this a little bit uh, on the next slide. And the other thing that we've done this year is, is looking at small grains again is transition oats and alfalfa. This farm is by Madrid, Iowa. It's 143 acres. And it's a great laying farm. Uh, took it over in 2019. So it's conventional soybeans in 18. We started the transition in 19. We just finished harvesting it about two weeks ago. We planted it March 28th. And oats, one bushel of oats, 22 pounds of alfalfa. We ended up with 80 bushel oats and one ton straw, and we believe we'll get another cutting of alfalfa off that before this fall. And just a little bit more pictures throughout the season. Uh, this is July 21st when it was when we cut the oats. And one thing to to think about on oat harvest this year was it was about a week later than normal, and that's because we had healthy, good growing oats that uh, had good test weight. They just wouldn't die down as in normal years when we get that that disease and wet weather. So one of the things that we we do not like taking straw off usually, but with the alfalfa we have to take it off so it doesn't impact the alfalfa growth. So we did take straw off of this. Just something to note: we we normally don't do the straw off our field. And so thinking that looking at our transition oats and alfalfa field plan budget, this was year one. Uh, we have a seeding of $111, the field conditioning right before that. Again, we're coming right after soybeans, so not a lot of tillage, light field conditioning. We pay $40 an acre to have it combined. Uh, we had the straw bale at $13 a bale or $13 an acre. We had the gathering bales. Uh, we'll have mowing hay, raking hay, round baling again, and then truck hauling of all the, the commodities that came off of it. 
organic paperwork, and then new seeding alfalfa insurance. So our cost in this field is $291. Uh, we, we figure the total revenue of being about $410 if we don't, uh, um, $410, but then a gross income of 119. Our rent on this field is 250, so we'll lose about 160, $170 on this field this year, but have we had excellent weed control. We had very little management, and we're we're very happy with the outcome on this field. And one of our customers in North Central Iowa did organic oats. He did quite a few of them. This is in oh, Steve. All right. So this is in Lorenz, Iowa, uh, 108 acres. He had transition corn, transition soybeans, organic corn, and decided to go to organic oats after it for a small grain as he had raised soybeans, organic soybeans the year before and wanted to minimize the soybeans acres. He picked a good year to go to go to oats. We'll just we'll jump through his uh, farm a little bit throughout the year on the next few slides here. July 3rd, he got it. If we start at the beginning, he got a really good early planting. We had good cool weather during the growing and the flowering. We had a really good growing season. And so this is a July 3rd picture. No weeds out there. Uh, very good stand. Off to a great start. July 16th, he called and asked when he was going to harvest because we, we always figure July 10th through that 15th. Uh, healthy oats, as we talked about, survive a lot longer. And a lot of our growers figured that out this year. Is, is we were one to two weeks behind because of the healthy, healthy high test weight oats were still downloading sugar and haven't died off. And we're just finishing up oat harvest for most of our, our producers this year uh, throughout the country. So looking at the organic oats field plan budget, uh, they did plow this. They had $15 an acre in plowing. They had $46 an acre in solid manure spreading. They field condition it, they drilled it, and combined it, and then they'll field condition it one more to take take out the weeds that were under the oats. And we don't have it in the budget because we haven't they haven't confirmed it yet, but they'll put a cover crop back on and go back to organic corn the next year. But if we look at 80 bushel oats, uh, we put $4 a bushel in there, uh, $360 uh, an acre of revenue, and we think they might even hit that $5 bushel mark uh, with the high test weight that they had. So they're looking at a gross income without rent is $202 per acre. Average rent up there being 250 to 275. They were very happy with uh, uh, looking at the long-term outlook of doing oats. And yes, they have a loss, but no weeds and they'll be able to build to a better organic corn year next year. And the management was a lot lower than soybeans. One of the things that uh, came quite apparent to me is we have to look at small grains, not year one year at a time. We look at them as a as a soil building, weed management, uh, overall farm management, uh, rather than a one year as as a conventional farmer look at corn and soybeans. Small grains in the Midwest, specifically in Nebraska, Iowa, Southern Minnesota, where our rent is 250 to 350, it's difficult right now to make money. I mean. This year was one of the better years, uh, just because of the yield, the, the climate that we had to grow small grains. We look oats, barley, wheat, rye. Again, these are general that we're finding over average of cost of production. And we look, the cost of production does not change that much between all of these. We're looking at a 10 to five to $10 range of cost of production on average of what, of what we expect. And so, Thinking about the decision making of what grows best in your area, what do you have markets for, and being realistic about the numbers. If we look at oats, uh, 70 bushels is probably realistic for our area, and the test weight is still a question. But total revenue of $380 with a gross revenue over cost, not including land rent, is $120 an acre. That's pretty hard to make it on 250, 350 bushel ground. But if we look at over it as a 10-year average, just organic corn, organic soybeans, uh, the the benefits of weed control management throughout the entire farm, it it, it has payoffs. 
And if we look at 100 bushels an acre, it gets a, a good test weight. We can be up in that 340. I wouldn't recommend planting on that, but we have seen that this year, getting close to that 100 bushels. Uh, barley is the same way, 60 to 80 bushel average. Uh, throughout the years, you know, average 60, really good years, 80. We've seen prices 550 to 650. Uh, so good years can pay off in the Midwest. Wheat, 60 to 80 bushels, uh, 60 being average, 80 being a good year. We've seen yields above that, but not on a on a year over year basis. Good protein will get you $11. Uh, average wheat will, will fetch $7. And so looking at $255 to $700 on really good wheat, I wouldn't, this is a one in five years, one in seven years in my aspect of, of getting that kind of wheat yield with good protein. Looking at rye, again, this is the, the markability, 50, 50 bushels to 80 bushels, six to $9. Uh, looking at a straw revenue of $100, but a gross revenue of 130 to $550. This gives you a good starting of where to think about what markets are available in my area, what is relatively reasonable cost of production, and what's an average yield and what's a really good yield, and thinking about that on a five to 10 year rotation. So small grain takes away. Small grain should be viewed as an investment for successful long-term organic rotation. And we went through the numbers. It's pretty obvious year over year that it's, it's difficult to make money on, on organic uh, small grains, but it really is a long-term successful organic rotation. You need those small grains to be a part of that if you don't have alfalfa or some, some other way of managing weeds. Uh, success requires thoughtful consideration, uh, planning execution, and this goes from planting, being ready to plant as early as possible, to understanding how oats, small grains react when harvesting them. One of the one of the, the the things that we ran into this year is understanding how small grains sweat. I can harvest nine to ten percent moisture oats, put them on a truck overnight, and they'll be fifteen percent moisture, fourteen percent moisture by the morning just because of the sweating. Of course, we hauled them three hours away to deliver them, and we the people did work with us on that delivery, but understanding all those little nuances that cost extra money for execution and planning has been crucial to learning how to do small grains. Disease control, when to apply, what to apply, uh, how to scout, those are all different learnings that we, we've had to do on our farm and at AgriSecure, and then marketing. The, the difference in marketing I've seen on at least our oats is about a dollar a bushel uh, from the lowest to the highest uh, of marketing transitional oats and organic oats. So understanding when to market, when to call, what, what, uh, what information to, to understand of where the markets are heading. Last year was a, a very bad oat year. Uh, markets were pretty good this year if you could get good test rate and market it early. Uh, so understanding all those are things that, uh, that are new to Midwest uh, crop farmers. One of the things uh, intercropping can, that we'll go over later is intercropping can provide additional economic or agronomic benefits. And we'll dive into that in the whole section later. So with that, do we have any questions, additional questions around small grains for the team? If not, all right. So, so Bryce, one question that did come up from a participant uh, uh, beforehand uh, as they registered was around seed treatments. And so uh, I think this might be a good opportunity to talk about, you know, seed treatments uh, for small grains and alfalfa and maybe even anything that we're mixing in for the intercropping. Yes, and and I'll give you a view of our farm. Uh, one of the things that we've, we've committed to when going organic is keeping the money in our town and, and on our farm. And, you know, one of the things that we realized organic or conventionally, we were paying for all this stuff and did it really work and see treatments was, was one of those. Um, and, and so this doesn't, 
this isn't uh, an overall view because there's obviously different situations. But my view on seed treatments is I'd rather purchase more seeds than, than seed treatments and put more seed out there uh, as what we've done on our farm. I think there there is some validity to seed treatments. I just haven't seen the ROI significantly year over year for, for using them in organic. I'm not saying it doesn't exist and there isn't good ones out there that uh, should be tested and trialed on your own farm. Our personal view is we'd rather spend more money on seed and seed treatments and specifically in organic. And that's how we've, we've, we've done it on our production farm. And, and speaking on behalf of Angela Secure, so that's Bryce's perspective on their farm. Yeah. And, speak, and I think it's something that's been shared by some of our, our members as well. Um, I was speaking on behalf of AgriSecure, of course, you know, the first step um, is to make sure any seed treatments that we're considering have been approved for organic use uh, and that we're working with the certifying agency to make sure that uh, uh, that they're going to be okay for in your organics. And of course, anybody should be doing that on any operation for organics or in their transition years as well. Uh, the next step is that Agriscan really focuses on getting the basics right. Uh, 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 and so, um, and so we really focus on starting with the basics and then starting to experiment at the edges and, and learning more before we go and give strong recommendations. And so, for example, we'd be talking about intercropping, intercropping is something where we know we don't have all the answers. Uh, we think that there's a lot of potential there to really enhance the rotation in a variety of different dimensions. And seed treatment might be something like that, where we can work with our members uh, over time, understanding who wants to experiment with them or have them out, and then trying to validate which ones work or don't work. Um, and I should, I should be clear, Steve, there, we do do some seed treatments, such as inoculant on soybeans, inoculant on peas. Uh, and we do test trial other seed treatments uh, on a small scale. And I think that's probably more of how we should have answered that question is, is there's good things that work out there. There's things that don't. Uh, and we recommend trialing them on a small, small area of your farm to make sure there's an ROI. So Rice, we had, Rice, we had a few more questions on small grains. One, uh, it was just a comment around uh, the risk of moving uh, out of the field uh, to delivery without binning oats first and running some air over them. Uh, so, you know, was there, the question was, you know, why didn't we do that um, and sweat them in the bin a little bit before delivering them? Yeah, there's, um, that's a good question. There's a cost of putting them in the bin. There's a cost that, what's that? Is that in retrospect, yeah, that made, that, that would have been the right thing to do. <laughs> It, yes, but there's a cost of putting them in the bin and there's a cost of taking them out of the bin. And fortunately, as we looked at the, a lot of the economics, adding more cost was not an option. Uh, and so that's why we shipped them out of the field. Yes, yeah, so the best way if you have it and it's, it's easy access, uh, this field wasn't easy access to bring it to a bin. Uh, the best way is to sweat them in a bin and, and deliver them. And the other question was, what's our approach to fertility on small grains? And do we have any insights on in what you try to do to hit food grade test weights for oats? Yes, yep. So the approach to fertility on small grains is for, for me and what I would advise right now, uh, less is better when you start and work your way up. So applying less to make sure we don't run into issues in test trialing, maybe small areas of that field of applying more to get better yields or higher test weights. Small grains are very finicky and, and over applying manure can cause a lot of issues and heartache uh, more than the returns are going to be from over, and I shouldn't say over applying manure, but applying manure at a high rate. And so a lot of testing and trialing needs to be done on, on fertilizer applications to be able to, to understand how far you can push it. And then you, you start talking about the change in weather every year. Uh, it, it gets pretty difficult. So our philosophy, yes, we might take a little less yield, but our harvest ability and everything else that goes along with it, we probably under apply manure to our small grains 
uh, consciously to make sure we don't run into issues at harvest. And we're moving it up a little, little by each year, understanding where that, uh, that perfect spot is. And again, I think that's one of the areas where there's, you know, opportunity expected organics where some of these markets, uh, there may be opportunities now that hadn't been uh, in these regions and the regions that we work in for quite a while. And so that's where, you know, trialing and learning over, over time is really important. Um, and so, you know, if anyone has a, a perspective on how they manage uh, fertility in their small grains, feel free to raise your hand or just shoot me a, a note saying that you'd like to add a comment in and we're happy to hear from you as well. So, um, Steve, there's one more question. Uh, yeah, that one I was going to save for the end. Um, All right. It's it's about organic fertility, so I thought we could save that one, and then we have one other one about alfalfa that we'll come back to at the end as well. Perfect. All right, so let, let's let's move on to intercropping, and um, as Bryce had, had mentioned, or as we started off with, you know, el the long-term rotation in organics is key. How do you make sure that you're balancing the economics of a long-term rotation? along with the agronomics, what's gonna allow you to manage weeds and maintain that soil fertility and soil health, but also operationally, what's gonna fit into your operation that's gonna give you the best chance to be able to make sure that you execute across all the different variety of, of crops that you have in the field. So again, we're gonna kick off this with just a short video um, that will be kind of a, a teaser or a trailer for some longer videos that we'll be posting online soon and I will show you. Biodiversity is one of the most important aspects of organic farming. Uh, it allows us to make management decisions and allows us to keep weeds at control. And the way we do that with intercropping, we plant two crops at once, which they work together synergistically. Use to uh, create nitrogen. Canola uh, uses nitrogen, so we don't use a lot of fertilizer. And then they, they grow together, keeping down the weeds as best as possible. And are harvested at the same time, creating the biodiversity not only uh, in the soil but on top of the soil as well, working together. Then creating that synergistic effect in the soil of not just having corn and soybeans anymore. We're we're getting corn, soybeans. We're getting two more crops in that rotation. Biodiversity is. I'm gonna hand it over to Bryce. So, as we talked through the small grains earlier, uh, just a few minutes ago. One of the things that we've learned is that the, the economics are pretty hard in, in certain areas of the country. And so intercropping is the next place that we looked at uh, bringing that revenue up to something that would be workable in the, in the high productive areas that have that $250, $350 rent. Uh, and, and so we're gonna look at intercropping throughout our farm. We started 2018 with five acres, 2019, with about triple that 15 acres. And then 2020, I decided to go to 500 acres. And that probably wasn't the right decision in hindsight, but uh, you know, if, if, if you don't cause a little pain, uh, you're not gonna learn. And so we learned a lot this year and we'll walk through that. Uh, we still think this intercropping provides a good opportunity, uh, increased revenues, increased biodiversity, increase the things that uh, increase longevity on your organic farm. So this is our farm in Manning, Iowa. Uh, we call it the Gray Farm. It's 68 acres. 2019, it had five different crops on it that we were testing out. Uh, it came out with conventional soybeans, had transition rye, field peas. 19, had transition oats, it had canola, and, and a bunch of other things around this farm, but we'll focus on the, the canola and field peas. Our yield in 2019 was 10 bushel canola and 35 bushel peas. Uh, Steve, you can move to the next one. In 2020, we did it again, and this is a 38 acre field. We had about 500 acres of peas and canola. And this is our 38 acre field in Manning. It came off a of transition rye, transition field peas, organic corn in 19. And then in 20, it was uh, trans or organic canola and field peas. And during this year, we expected 10 to 30 bushel canola and 30 to 40 bushel peas. 
we had some issues come in and so we'll go through the budget of what happened and why and and why things occurred and what we learned this year. So this is uh, in Minburn, Iowa, actually one of our fields uh, planted March 29th. The emergence was delayed due to dry, dry weather in April. Uh, seed selection was very important. Inoculation of the, the pea seed or important aspects of the research that we were trying to learn through this field. You can see by May 8, 2020, we had a good stand of uh, peas and canola. The peas emerged prior to the canola. The canola growth was, was stunted, we feel, by that April 15th, April 25th, when it dropped down to 20 to 25 degrees. The peas thrive in that weather, and the, the canola was stunted, and even, we think, froze off a little bit of the stand uh, throughout all of our fields that we had during that uh, uh, drop in temperature. But the canola growth uh, caught back up for the most part with the peas and provided that symbiotic relationship. And as you heard in the picture, canola takes about 70 to 90 pounds of nitrogen to grow. And per peas provide about 70 to 100 pounds of nitrogen during their growth cycle. So that symbiotic relationship, not only in, in keeping weeds down, but also in that nutrient uh, management side of it. So on June 29, 2020, we can see a pea canola mass together to create the, the support system. We can see some weeds popping through, but uh, we're not worried about them because they're not going to seed. In about four or five days here, we came and swathed this field, and I'll take you through the harvest that uh, went on. And we control a strong with sufficient stand. Uh, additional work we have to do on the seeding rates and varieties, but we 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 messed around the seeding rates uh, this year and really think we dialed it in for next year. Uh, peas started to dry down ahead of the canola this year, and we think that's because they got the head start with that cool weather in April. So that was one of the main issues that we had is canola seemed about a week behind last year and a week behind the peas. So we swat early to avoid pea shatter, but we we feel like we lost quite a bit of canola that wasn't ready, needed one or two weeks. But we made that conscious decision that we're going to go after the peas and and sacrifice the canola. And Bryce, do you want to talk a little bit? Uh, you mentioned the structure and the math that was being created, but you know the benefits of that for field peas uh, relative to what you saw when you when you tried just peas alone. Yeah, so so field peas are a great crop for soil. That's why we want to integrate them into our system. But the issue field peas have is they grow really quickly up front, which is really good. But once they start drying down, they open up. Uh, right about that June 29th, they start to open up, and and the weeds hit that sunlight. And time they're ready to harvest, uh, you have a, a thick thick mat of weeds out there that that can be hard to get through. And so having that canola in there when the peas dry down really prevents that sunlight from hitting the ground really prevents that last growth of weeds that uh, uh, can har hinder harvesting okay thank you so thinking it we'll start at the beginning here uh, of this intercropping and, and start with the management uh, um, and walk through that is if you're thinking about intercropping you have to have the right equipment and we have a, a 30 foot drill that can see two different crops that's the first start of it uh, and we think about from starting from the seed being able to store pea seed and canola seed is we took in a thousand bushels of pea seed or about 1500 bushels of pea seed and that's quite a few bags of, of or totes of, of seed. Thinking about storage of seed, it was even troubling when we went through this process to how to get it into the drill. We had to treat pea seed in, into the drill, and so we built a treater on our, our uh, uh, seed tender to inoculate uh, pea seed into the drill. Where do you get the organic inoculant? Uh, how do you set the drill? We built uh, um, with we built weigh meters on each section of our drill to be able to meter the seed from uh, pea seed at doing three bushels to uh, canola seed doing three and a half pounds, 
all that stuff has to be planned for and executed and has to be done before time. And we thought our plan was to come in and direct cut these. Uh, and as you can see with these pictures here of July 9th, that was one of our fields. Uh, we had a custom swath. Luckily we had a swather, but on about June 29th, we were searching frantically around Canada to find a, a self-propelled swather. And as you can see on the right, a, a pickup had to do 500 acres. And so I highly suggest if you're doing small grains from what we've learned and even intercropping, that you have a self-propelled swather. We bought a 30 foot, uh, 30, 30 foot head self-propelled swather that we did most of our cutting with and a really nice pickup head. And we even did a lot of our small grains with that. And it was a lot easier. And so being prepared from planting all the way to harvest. So we, we swathed July 3rd to July 29th. Uh, the canola was not maturing as fast as we would have liked. By July 9th, it was ready. We had better yield on that in those fields. Uh, July, it took about two to three days to dry down and we came back and used a pickup header to pick it up. And it seems like we lost a lot less peas this year with our pickup header. A lot easier on the combine uh, flowing through and we were able to harvest a lot quicker. Uh, as you can see in the picture, I'd recommend buying a high quality pickup header if you're going to do it. Uh, we had the swather on the left last year we had a pickup head that was probably 15 years older. I can tell you the ease of harvest, net, harvesting, the, the less breakdown, get, get good equipment if you're going to do this. And Bryce, we had a similar question that we'll come back to later on the alfalfa. You know, how many acres do you need to do intercropping to get a return on the investment in the equipment? Yeah, I mean, the the whole setup, you're probably looking at 250 to 500 acres if you're going to do it at scale long term uh, and, and have all the equipment available to you. Okay, so consistently having that 250, 500 acres in your rotation is at that point where the, the investment uh, in the equipment makes sense. Yes, and then I even forgot Steve talking through so we have the canola and peas together. Uh, we harvest them, put them on a, a truck or a grain cart, bring them to the bin site where we have, uh, we built a separator, uh, runs in and, and separates the peas and canola, uh, a quick clean. And it goes, one goes to one bin and the other one goes to the other bin. So you have that investment as well. All right, lots of advice uh, for those who are interested, reach out to Bryce. Uh, Bryce, before you get into the, all the economics here, we did have a question around uh, the canola and what's the market for the canola? Is that one yeah, so they developed in the oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, so the, the market for the canola is actually fairly significant and growing. Uh, canola is usually raised up in Canada, uh, but due to GMO canola up there, it's it's highly likely to get cross contamination in canola due to the flowering. And so it's very limited where you can grow organic canola. And there is quite a, a significant market. I marketed with Schooler Company, uh, and they're actually looking for, for more if they could get it. Um, but uh, there is, there's a growing market. There's a, a pretty stable market for organic canola that goes into organic uh, canola meal and and the real value is the organic canola uh, uh, oil for different restaurants and food products. And one of the things that we like about it is, or the, the it's, it can't be grown everywhere, and specifically, it can't be grown. It, it can be grown in Canada, but significant measures make it almost cost prohibitive of having so many setbacks of miles and miles and miles. Talking what I've heard is 15 to 30 miles from the next canola field in Canada if the, to prevent contamination. Yep, canola seed is prolific because of the long flowering period and uh, cross-contamination. Uh, the question that we received is, you know, so it's great to have the market for canola, but you can't probably go to your current seed uh, seed company and find that, that they have the right canola seed variety. So what did you do to find the varieties or that you're using now uh, for canola and, and, and peas? 
Yeah, that, that, that's a great question and, a, and a, kind of an interesting journey. Uh, it's uh, It took me about two years. Uh, I actually started with a, a European gentleman in Kentucky that has raised quite a bit of canola. Uh, two to three hour conversations with him to understand what I was doing and understand what I needed, uh, learned about the different varieties of canola across the world, understand why we use certain ones, where we use certain ones, what kind of uh, uh, potential risks there are to using certain ones. And it, it came down to two varieties. There's an Argentine variety and a Polish variety. Argentine variety is a lot longer growing season. The Polish variety is a lot shorter growing season. So when we narrowed it down to the Polish variety, uh, the, there's not a significant amount of seed companies. I was directed up to South Dakota to photo Syntec, uh, which developed a, a, a good photo, a good canola variety, and spent you know a few months talking to them on uh, which or how we should go about doing this, and finally picked a seed out uh, from photo Syntec that matched my field peas, and. Uh, had good conversation and learning along the way from good good people to help uh, direct me in the right path. I think one of the keys to that story is that for a lot of a lot of these opportunities, uh, if you don't know somebody who's done it and kind of paved the way, you're going to have to do a lot of the due diligence and 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 a lot of the effort to try making it work out. So uh, yeah. Yep. Why don't you hop into the economics here? Yeah. So this is the 19 economics uh, and 20 economics. In 19, we dissed it, fuel conditioned it, drilled it. Our seed cost is about $110 uh, an acre for this. Uh, three and a half pounds of canola and about three bushels of peas. Our harvest, we charge about $45 an acre and our rent's about 300 we do an insurance, uh, and I won't get into it, but there is an insurance for it. Not through regular channels, uh, but it's about eight bucks an acre. And, and in 19, we did about 35 bushel peas and 10 bushel canola, a total revenue of about $720, or a net income, and this, we apologize for changing it up on you guys, but net income of $227 an acre. Uh, in, in 2020, not much changed on the cost side, except we did swath it, so we added $15 an acre of cost to that to get us a total of $508 an acre of cost of production. This year, uh, on this field, and this was our field in Manning, we had higher pea production, but much lower canola production due to that difference, and we feel like we put a lot of canola out the back of the combine, capturing the peas, uh, but again, looking at about the same total revenue and a little bit less net income. And so feeling we, mother nature took over this year and it evened itself out. Uh, you know, there's things that we could have done different, but we, we feel 35 bushel to 42 bushel peas and that 10 to 20 bushel canola uh, switching a few of the management styles is, is possible. So one of the other things that we've traveled through AgroSecure on one of the, the, the farms in Northeast Nebraska is field peas and oats. Uh, and this was 27.1 acres uh, coming off of organic corn. Uh, the yield target was 30 bushel peas and 30 bushel oats. And very excited about this mix. It's probably the best mix that works well to go together. But the, the issue comes when marketing the oats. Uh, just hit and miss on quality makes makes this a little bit harder to, for, for production. <coughs> Next one, Steve. Do you just want to talk uh, just a little bit about the at harvest, so the difference with the peas and oats and how you can store them versus the cola and, and peas? That is, yes, that's good to bring up. And so jumping back to canola and peas, one of the things that we've learned is do not leave them in a truck or a grain cart or on a combine, which can be difficult sometimes. I mean, if you finish up harvesting at nine, nine o'clock at night, you have to separate and unload that truck until 12, one in the morning. Uh, so that's a management uh, difference between peas and oats is I can harvest them 
and put them straight in the bin and separate them later. So peas and canola is one thing that has to be separated that day. Peas and oats have to can be put in a bin and separated later, just uh, due to how they collect the moisture and set up and and how they transfer moisture between crops. So the the management of peas and oats at harvest is a little bit easier. And and going back to uh, I think you can apply the question both to this field potentially and and your peas canola. So what are you what are you doing after the canola field? So what would that field go to in twenty? So the, the peas and canola field uh, will go to fall seeded alfalfa. Uh, one of the benefits of having the peas and canola and doing fall seeded alfalfa, we look over a five to 10 year rotation, is I don't, I get 90%, 90 to 95% of my production of alfalfa that next year. I don't have that, that leg year of 100 to $200 loss. So having that peas and canola fall seeded alfalfa actually saves me 100 to 200 dollars than having to establish that alfalfa in the next year so building that's what we help do at agri-secure that's one of our goals to to bring the farmers is understanding this is a long-term five to ten year rotation understanding those costs and and how everything interacts together and what affects those costs because adding another 100 or 200 dollars to that budget of, of cost savings because i can fall seed alfalfa that's significant. That's a that's a big change uh, in the overall agronomic and economic impact of, of a rotation. And if you're not going, if you're somebody who's not going into alfalfa, uh, you know, after that earlier season harvest, uh, what would you recommend uh, for for how to follow that up? So, sorry, say that again, Steve. So let's say that you're, you know, you're, you're not doing alfalfa on your organic operation. What would yep. you do after the pea canola, or in this case, uh, also after pea oats? Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things uh, that uh, I've been testing and trialing is, uh, and seeing across the country, working from Illinois to New Mexico, up to South Dakota, North Dakota, over to Colorado, seeing a lot of people try different things. Um, I'm very excited about no-till organic in certain certain aspects, and these are one of these these aspects where I'm really excited about it. Corn soybean rotation, you know, using hairy vetch and cereal rye is, is such a hit and miss because we have to plant so late that, that we have see issues. Uh, one of the things that we're actually trying in one of the fields after the peas and canola this year is we're starting to plant cereal rye right now. Uh, we hope to have that cereal rye one to three feet tall, depending on the moisture that we get before we go into winter. Uh, way ahead of the weeds coming out of the spring, we'll early plant soybeans into it and then come back and roll it. So getting this intercropping or small grain, whatever you decide to do, I think opens the doors more to to the, the no-till organic uh, rather than a corn soybean rotation that just I've seen add extra issues to the, the no-till organic that, that gives advantages being able to early August, September seed some of those cover crops. Or, you know, one of the other aspects is just getting a 10 species cover crop mix after this, uh, really working on soil health and going back to organic corn. Yep, so there's a variety of different options that this can unlock. Uh, given where you are and what you want to try to experiment with or what's been in that field for the previous three years, including that, uh, that inner crop. Do you want to come back to the, the field budget here for Ray Brothers, Bryce? Yeah, yep. And so looking at the field budgets uh, for organic field peas and oats, uh, we have disking, field conditioning, drilling. I, they have a faulty that alfalfa associated in this, this cost too as well. Uh, they also, at the $153, they have growing and spraying. Uh, they use prosthetic as a fungicide, uh, which we highly suggest uh, looking into. We used it on quite a few acres this year. Uh, you're looking at $15 to $20. Uh, a good fungicide on small grains is very helpful. I am very, I don't do it on much of my corn and soybeans organically, but I do recommend it on small grains just because of the disease pressure. Uh, so 15 to $20 on that. 
they associate $38 with combining, $30 with hauling, and they have $254 rent, and they have an organic paperwork cost on this as well. So they have $540 an acre of, uh, of cost into organic field peas and oats on this field. They had the, this is 2019, so they had peas sold at $17 or $510 of revenue. Uh, they had the oats sold at 450, so they're looking at $645 of revenue or an income of about $104. What's getting their alfalfa seeded? And Bryce, for the so fun I oh, go ahead. Yeah, for the fungicide you mentioned here, is that something where it's ground applied or aerial, or uh, does it depend? Uh, I mean, it really depends. We decide to go ground applied on small grains. I know we're going to run some over, but we feel like we get better coverage. I know you could aerial apply it uh, at about the same cost. And so it, it really matters what's available to you. Um, we just feel we get better coverage on ground applied, uh, but it, 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 it's different for every operation. And I see we have a, a question about the short season oat. Oh, yep. Sorry. Thank you. Yep. And so, so everyone was, you know, it, it, for the oats and the peas are using a short season variety uh, and what varieties have worked. Yeah. And, and I apologize. I don't know the, the, uh, the variety of oats that was being on, being used on Ray Brothers. I know they've trialed quite a few of them. Uh, and, and we've gotten a lot of our data from practical farmers. They have really good data on oats. Uh, just yield test trials, uh, varieties that have worked. I can tell you on oats that we haven't found a variety that is going to mature the same time that field peas do. So we, we have a loss of field pea harvest to get the oats. Uh, um, we're harvesting peas and oats currently, or probably about a week ago on Ray Brothers. And so we haven't found oats that mature early enough for peas so we're taking that sacrifice of losing a few peas during harvest to wait till the oats mature. One of the things that I think we can do uh, during to decrease this impact is to make swathing more of a more of a operation to make these mature at the same time or close to it. Okay. And let's move on. So you know, the first two uh, examples of intercrop we discussed were involving field peas and companion crops for those field peas. Now we're going to shift over to wheat and soybeans with Amy. All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Amy Brook. I'm an advisor for AgriSecure and an owner operator of Cyclone Farms um, near York, Nebraska. We have approximately 1,500 acres of organic and transition land right now. And we actually are gonna rewind. Um, my information is from last year, um, but it's very pertinent, I think, to the conversation. And it's another take on intercropping with stable crops. Basically, um, you know, in the Midwest, we typically don't often have the opportunity to get two crops in subsequently. So this was an idea, a concept to plant both crops, hard red winter wheat and soybeans in the windows that they should be planted in and trying to not overthink too much that way. Um, so this field that I selected, actually I did it in two spots and I'm gonna kind of bounce back and forth between the two, two tests that I actually did. Um, the field that you can see here was about 135 acres. Um, all my fields are silt loam fields, so very similar soil on both of the fields. But the difference between my fields were um, the one that you can see there is hard red winter wheat planted in seven and a half inch, drilled actually. And then the beans were drilled at seven and a half inch, just um, offset from that hard red winter wheat. I did 135 acres of that, and then I did 40 acres of hard red winter wheat drilled at seven and a half inch and then soybeans that were offset and planted in 30 inch into the hard red winter wheat. So those are the two differences because I wanted to understand which which potential mechanism um, was better for my fields. Yield targets on these fields were just slightly lower than normal. I was trying to 
dampen my my optimism on yields, but still see if I could get all of this to pencil out. So I was really aiming for wheat in that 40 to 55 bushel range, and my soybean target was 35 to 45 when I combined both practices. So if we go to the next slide, we can kind of see some of the pictures in season. So um, on the left, you can see the wheat, um, and this is right at pre-joint stage. So really you can drive on your field when you have wheat um, basically anytime you want until you get at that joint stage. And I actually did a rotary hoe pass into this wheat. Um, just had a little bit of activity that I wanted to eliminate just on some mare's tail and penny press. So I did rotary hoe this wheat, um, but yeah, pre-joint, pre you wanna get those soybeans into um, the wheat so you're not causing any damage to that wheat. So um, that actually occurred um, April 29th. So it's a little concerning to plant soybeans, or organic soybeans on April 29th um, without a seed treatment. So what I recommend is definitely increase your population there. And you need to plant them deeper than what you originally would intend planting um, soybeans because you do not want them to compete that much with the, with the wheat. You want them to really stay below the surface as long as they can to get that wheat higher up so you eliminate or reduce competition. And then June 9th, there's just a nice picture of those beans um, popping up into the wheat. And uh, the one thing that I noticed, my observations on the beans, you know, with, with the wheat in the field, you're just not gonna get the architecture of the beans quite like you would get if you planted them without anything in the field. They're gonna be a little bit more spindly. Um, they're actually gonna try to reach up to the sun a little quicker. So really it's kind of game on between those two crops once the uh, soybeans emerge. Um, let's see. And I guess one other thing to note when you do have the two crops growing simultaneously, my sole management focus at the time when I did have the wheat, uh, the beans growing into the wheat was just a wheat management program is what I was doing. Just looking at this, uh, the health of my wheat until I harvested that. And I ignored the soybeans while they were growing. And, and Amy, we got one quick question. Uh, and it was, do you mount your drill with a uh, three point to avoid sway and maintain the inner row planting location when planting the soybeans between the wheat rows? Oh, that's a really good question. Ideally, you know, I really enjoy um, mounted equipment because you can eliminate the sway, especially if you're on hillsides and things. But um, unfortunately, I, some of my equipment is still pull behind. Um, my drill is 35 foot, and so it's a pull behind drill. But yeah, I mean, if you can, um, if you can get mounted equipment, that's great. But just, you know, this operation of my inner cropping was leveraging equipment that I already had on hand. There, one interesting thing about the wheat and the beans is there was really no capital investment on my acres to conduct this, um, well, it was a little larger than an experiment, but conduct this um, analysis. So yeah, I, I think, you know, you just kind of got to leverage what you have sometimes, but ideally hitch mount equipment is, is probably better, especially the more passes, you know, in row crops that you have, it's easier to stay on the same lines. And were you using RTK? Yeah, yep. We have RTK and, you know, that should be, that should be perfect, but you know, sub two inch accuracy still, you know, is just sometimes not accurate enough. But um, yeah, you just kind of have to. That's why you know I think um, there's value in experienced operators running equipment. Some of this stuff can't be automated to the point of of no operators sometimes. But yes, um, all my passes are done with RTK. Thank you. Yep, good questions. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right, fast forward um, more into the season. These are pictures of the drilled on drilled, um, July 10th. So basically you can see it was a, pretty much the calm before the storm. You know, we talk about when should you harvest things. I was a little nervous. Our wheat at this point was still north of um, 25%. And you can see 
you know, the onset of the beans creeping into the canopy of the wheat. Originally, we were going to use a stripper head to just pull those tops of the wheat off and, you know, leave all the residue. But, you know, there was just too much competition between the beans and the wheat, which wasn't bad. We had a dryer, so we chose to harvest the wheat at north to 25%. If you look, universities do not recommend this. I do not recommend harvesting that wet a wheat if you do not have a dryer. You need to get that dry before you put it in a bin and it needs to be, you know, kind of as Bryce and even mentioned before, it really needs to be fairly dry because it'll kind of pick on or pick up a little bit of um, moisture as well. So you have to compensate for that. So we were able to double run it through a dryer and get it down to that 15, 16% moisture. And um, still actually we're able to preserve quality. Um, so anyway, that was kind of an asterisk with me if we're harvesting that wet, what is gonna be protein and what's gonna be the quality of the wheat. But in my case, everything um, magically worked out, which, you know, you just, I don't know if that's something you can count on year after year doing that, but in this case it did. Um, we did clip the beans. You know, I've done experiments clipping beans, cutting beans at a very young age to encourage branching. I didn't know it flowering because, you know, flowering will start the end of June. It, how this would work on these soybeans by, you know, clipping them. They didn't get injured. They didn't get diseased by me cutting them. You know, they just were a little bit more lethargic. I did get a little bit of branching right at that cut, but they, they were pretty spindly just because of the growth needing to grow through the wheat, you know, from day one of their life. So it was just kind of interesting to observe, you know, the plant wasn't like your your soybeans planted without any competition. You know, they were a little bit different, but they were still, you know, gonna hit my target that I had originally set for the season. Okay, the next slide we're gonna see, fast forward to the other um, field that I had that was um, planted the beans in 30 inch rows into that wheat. Um, I had to do this on this particular field because it was actually a gravity irrigated field. And if I needed to get water to my beans, I needed to um, cultivate. And all of that residue and debris, because I left most of the straw, because I set my combine up pretty high just to get those heads and reduce the clipping of the soybeans, it, it was a lot of debris and mat to get through. And it required persistence and patience and, you know, those progressive type passes to get through that mat to actually see the soil between, between the plants. It was possible, I didn't know if it was, but it really did take patience and really, really somebody calm running the cultivator. Um, the beans actually stayed pretty clean, I must say. I was pretty surprised um, just because of no weed activity or weed management, you know, really up until middle of August. Um, they weren't canopied, so, you know, there was still, I needed to do later season management, weed management of my soybeans. Um, just because rain, all the rain we got afterwards, you know, stimulated more weed growth. But um, actually, we're able to keep them pretty clean. We did leverage and test out a zapper. Um, I always like to have backup plans and have some flexibility. So we purchased a zapper to have on hand to be ready if we did have, you know, quite a bit of weed activity um, as the season went on. You know, the capabilities of the weed zapper, we learned it's a, it's a relatively new piece of equipment. I'd say it's still experimental. Um, you know, it, the, we put it on a 300 horsepower tractor. It was a 40 foot and it, it was fairly effective in an application such as this where weeds were, you know, every 30 inches apart because, you know, there was just, we had cultivated it. So we got everything in row out. So if it's a traditional setup, I think the weed zapper can be fairly effective. Um, it was not effective on the drilled beans into the drilled wheat because, you know, just there was more volume of things coming into the weed zapper just because we couldn't cultivate. So that, that put too much strain on the unit and it would not handle that type of application. But um, in traditional 30 inch rows, it does have some, some um, positive results. So kind of just a little bit of an overview um, and just the activities that I went through. And this is really focusing more on the 30 inch, um, 30 inch beans into the drilled wheat. 
um, you know, we drilled the wheat. I, I mentioned that we rotary hoed it. We planted the beans um, really very early just because of uh, this, just what the stage of the wheat was. Um, I did apply a biofungicide. We were talking about kind of small grain management earlier. And, you know, depending on the season, um, sometimes you can get a benefit. We were a little bit rainy at times. So I wanted to see what I could do, do to preserve the quality of my grain. So I leveraged um, a biofungicide regalia made by Maroon Bio and then um, a copper hydroxide product, which does have um, natural disease fighting capabilities. It was an ALBA product called NuCop. Um, I got both of them approved by my certifier and was able to apply those. There's three kind of timings that wheat really um, needs to be observed and managed, three critical time frames, I should say. It's at that joint stage, which we talked, we put the beans in before that. We need to make sure plant health is good there. You need to make sure plant health is good at flag leaf. And you need to make sure plant health is good right when those heads are coming out. So if you're really managing those three um, windows in particular, you should have a higher success of getting a better quality wheat. Um, then we, you know, we combined it, hauled it away and cultivated a couple of times on our 30 inch beans, did the weed zapper, which I mentioned before, and then combined traditional time frame with the soybeans and hauled that away as well. So before moving on to the next crop, Amy, we do have one more question. Uh, and then I wanna just make sure participants feel free to ask additional questions around the wheat, soybean and their cropping. Mm -hmm. The we had was um, about uh, the cutting height uh, for the wheat and as well as did you blow the straw at the back? Yeah, I mean, we, we did not chop too much of that wheat, but yeah, we, we did spread the weed over the top, which, you know, the beans, it took a while for that to um, poke through. But um, yeah, we did do that. But we had minimal straw that we were um, bringing into the combine because we were just truly setting it right at that head level. Thank you. Yeah, no, good question. Appreciate the questions. Thank you. Um, and then the last slide is just kind of a, a summary and some learnings. Um, you know, varieties, we did talk about this earlier, Bryce did a good job of kind of discussing some thought process, processes on that, but hard red winter wheat variety selection is really important. Um, in my area, I chose to get a defensive variety. Um, it was an SY wolf. That is actually a dwarf type variety as well. So, you know, that's tough. If you're trying to do the intercropping, you might have to sacrifice one of your, um, one of your criterion because I would recommend getting something that's gonna canopy a little bit taller. Um, Ken's gonna talk about uh, Jamo Dowd's experiment with rye and soybeans. You know, getting something that can have a little bit more height to it is gonna protect you from getting weeds um, to grow and it's gonna dampen those beans from growing so fast. So, you know, getting something that maybe is a little taller could be better. And then population, I originally dropped about 90 pounds an acre and I should have dropped probably like 110 to 120 on that wheat. Um, so that's kind of my deciding factors on wheat and then um, other considerations for soybean row spacing. I think either have an opportunity to be beneficial, just kind of depends on your region. Um, me personally, I like the idea of the 30s because it gives me an opportunity if I need to get in there and do weed management. I know that that's possible, that I can if it's in 30 inches. You don't have any possibility, even with a zapper, really on uh, doing any weed management on a drilled on drilled application. Planting depth, again, plant those, you know, fairly deep, deeper than normal at that two, two and a half inch. And then planting population, you you want a stand of 150,000 or more. So you're gonna to have to plant quite a few more than 150,000 to get that stand just because of the potential for cold environment, early planting um, on those soybeans. And then, you know, maybe just a little bit of a reduction as the season goes on. Fertility plan, you know, um, in general, I would just recommend everybody truly looks at their own soil health and their deficiencies. When you're looking at what do you need to grow these crops, you gotta solve your deficiencies first and they're gonna be different on everybody's field. 
So solving those deficiencies first will help you be more successful in, solve, in, um, in small grains and actually all, all on your row crops. But for me, in my case, I was a little bit short on my nitrogen. It was visible in my tissue test. I was counting on some carryover, like a half-life with my litter. I did not see that. So um, that was another reason why my wheat was short. So nitrogen is incredibly important in um, wheat. Sulfur is another thing that's incredibly important, important on generating protein to get food grade quality in wheat, which has, a, has an exceptional um, revenue difference. If you can get food quality in wheat, it's not a guarantee, but as Bryce said, reducing your toxins is important. Um, and I tried to do that with my biofungicide application, but increasing your protein is also important on wheat. Um, so managing your soil deficiencies and, and then increasing your sulfur content. And that's really important in corn as well. And there are organic ways to do that. Um, and then lastly, weed management in the season, you know, that's one thing to count on when you're putting together your budget and looking at the viability of these intercrop options. But you also need to look at what does it do for your subsequent season? For me in particular, my intercropping fields were just a little bit messier this year. This, remember I did, did this intercropping in 2019, so I could have feel the effects of what it did to my, my soil in 2020. And I did do an extra weed management pass on my fields in 2020 on these, after these intercropping fields, just because I had a little bit more weed activity. But that's kind of, kind of the summary that I put together. And if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Thank, thank you, Amy. That was uh, really informative. I appreciate it. And if anybody has questions, I, I believe Amy will be sticking around to the end. We'll have another Q and A session. So uh, if if you get them in, I'll we'll come back to it. Now we're going to transition over to Ken, who's going to talk about one of our members' experience with transition rye and soy. Thank you, Steve. Um, so I work with Jamie O'Dowd up, up in Northeast Iowa in the Butler, Floyd County area. And he works uh, with two other farmers in the area. They all kind of share labor and equipment and ideas to help try and get across all of their acres in a timely fashion. And so they're really, these guys are a, a step ahead um, as far as being timely and proactive. And so they have the same question that basically everybody else has is, if I don't have an alfalfa market and I transition with corn, uh, what do I do in that second year? And what they wanted to do was try and raise the profitability on that second year. Uh, so they didn't really have to carry as much of a cost over into that third or into that first organic year. And so one of the ways that they did it is they took a different approach uh, versus right, uh, roll crimping the rye. So they have standing rye that they're going to harvest and standing soybeans that they'll also harvest. Um, this is on 72 acres, nice clay loam soil, uh, very square, ideal kind of field. And we had ideal weather conditions this year that really kind of benefited this. Um, so the one caution I would say to most people is probably don't bite off as big of a chunk, but um, the one benefit that they also had was that they've tried growing rye on their conventional acres first, just to kind of get some experience with understanding rye. And then they still had some herbicides that they could use if it got out of hand or got away from them. And so that gave them this level of comfort to be able to do this. And so if we go through there and we look, it's just that typical corn soybean rotation and the first year transition and their yield targets, uh, they adjusted the rye down a little bit which we'll go into a little bit more depth as to why, but they're expecting about 25 bushels of rye and 40 bushels of uh, soybeans. And one thing that I also like to say is, you know, if you're not following us on social media, uh, start doing it, Twitter, um, and hopefully these guys will have a, a nice drone video of them harvesting this, but you'll also be able to keep up on some of the other things that AgriSecure is doing and, and some of the growers in our network and what they're doing. So you can kind of get exposed to more. So make sure you do that. Um, but if we follow in, uh, June 3rd was this picture, and I planted the soybeans on uh, May 10th, I believe it was, and then the rye was planted last November. Um, Jamie said that the soil erosion, so they got some rains um, where you typically see some soil 
uh, movement with water across the field. They just didn't have it because the standing rye was there. So it kind of held all the soil in place. It was great for an erosion control early on in the season when we're getting a lot of those heavier rains. Uh, from a weed control aspect, it just did tremendous. It choked out a lot of the weeds. Uh, it really reduced the population of water hemp that they typically see out there, controlled some ragweed. Um, the one thing that they would say is that they would have liked to have planted the rye earlier um, so, it's, you know, maybe September instead of that November time frame, so that the rye could have gotten more established and got a little bit further ahead of those soybeans. They really are keen on the soybean being planted early on. And, and the reason for that is the, the big fear is that the later we plant the soybeans, um, they start competing for moisture. So the soybeans will, will not get as much moisture because the rye just starts sucking that up and, and using all of it and, and kind of leaves the soybean. So they notice in some low spots that they kind of, the, they have some of that, there's some struggling with the soybean. Um, the main reason they did this too was to reduce their tillage. They wanted to reduce the amount of passes that they had to make on their fields. And so this was a great way to do it. They got a nice big canopy from the rye um, and then the soybeans started to grow up and the, the soybeans look tremendous. So if we go to the next one, you'll see the soybeans as they grow. On the right there, they've gotten a lot bigger. Um, starting to flower. The problem that they, they noticed that they were having with the rye is that it's very similar to soybeans. So you're, you're limited to time frame of when to harvest because it'll pick up moisture. And so you really need it to be lower. So they're, they're basically harvesting between that one, one o'clock in the afternoon until about nine o'clock when they have to shut down. That's when they start to notice the rye taking on moisture again. So they shut down about that point. Um, the uh, the benefit the other thing that they've noticed with their harvest is that the timings really matters because as they're harvesting the rye they're able to stay ahead uh, keep a header above the soybeans so they're not clipping the soybeans or taking quite a bit uh, off and getting a bulk of it but since they have the limited time frame for harvesting they're getting across fewer acres throughout the day and with that now the soybeans are starting to catch up to the same size and height because they're going to try and grow to find that sunlight and with that they're going to end up taking less rye and so that's kind of why they have a yield reduction there is because they have to move the header up and they're okay sacrificing the rye um, in this case and especially you know on the organic side they would definitely be okay with doing that but the main reason uh, that they want they, this is this is a great transition tool for them, but they've also, you know, said that going forward with the acres and that they'll have uh, an organics that it, it just becomes too much management because of that time frame for harvesting. And so if we look at the cost um, and their budget, it, it does a, a really good job at kind of equalizing things, but it does take a lot more time management around the harvest time frame. So they have your, the fill conditioning. They drilled the rye back in uh, November. They did put on one and a half tons of manure. One thing that, you know, I'd stress kind of like Bryce has mentioned is that, you know, when we're putting on manure with small grains, um, especially when you have a companion like soybeans that also helps produce some nitrogen, the, I, the max that I've ever felt comfortable with even recommending to people is one and a half tons. And that, you know, typically the one ton is a little bit better and usually gives what you, you need. Um, that one and a half ton, you start getting into that area where it starts potentially causing other problems. One and a half is usually okay because you're paying more if you don't um, in application costs. So uh, we have the organic transition paperwork and some, then their planting was May 10th. Uh, then they're uh, harvesting the rye right now. They are getting about 25 bushels uh, for their yield. Their soybeans, are, they're expecting to still be at that 40, like we mentioned. Uh, one thing about the rye, why they have $8 a bushel is because this is the contract farm. So they, they were uh, approached to grow this on contract. And so, you know, that price might vary depending on where you're at and the need for rye and what those kind of markets look like. But you can see that their total uh, cost, excluding the rent, is about $264. Uh, 
they'll net about 200 for the rye and hopefully about 320 um you know as as we try to determine where the soybean price will, will land um so total revenue is about 520 dollars and then their gross income is about 246. so depending on what the uh the rent costs are you know that that's they're going to be pretty close to break even or maybe a little bit above or below so uh, they really got what they wanted to accomplish there which was not having to pay back from their next year organic crop to to cover some of these costs and um, i said it earlier but i'll, I'll state it again because steve recommended it earlier too is that the important thing here is to understand the basics um, for organic production make sure that you're understanding and executing the basics before you start experimenting on larger scale with these things and when you do start to experiment try not to do it on so many acres because like i said we had a great growing conditions and great uh time of year but you know if we would have had heavy rains during this time of harvest it, it could have created a lot more other challenges and there there was a lot to try and recover from if that be is the case but going forward they like this they're going to stick with this as a transition year two uh way to to get through transition but going forward they they don't want to take this program into organics just because it'll delay everything for them and it'll be harder to get across all their acres so can and we, continue to be able to manage at a high level thank you ken really nice recap we do have a few questions uh one of them is from somebody who raised their hand seneca um, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, I, uh, I've given you the ability to do that. Sorry, I think that was a um, mistake. Thank you. Okay, no worries. Uh, we do have a few other questions. So, uh, do you know what the row spacing was on the rye and soybeans? And then you know, when they planted the rye, did they leave a gap so that the soybeans could be drilled in uh, uh, in the uh, in the spring? Yeah, great question. Uh, and so what they did is that they plugged um, rows on the on their drill, and then that way that they left it perfect for their 30 inch spacing soybeans. And so that they just came in and drilled. They had their their rows basically set for them. Came in and drilled the soybeans in between there. So that way they they didn't have to worry about rye growing up in between the soybean plants themselves. Thank you, Quinn. So, and 15 inch rows on the on the rye and then split the rye with the soybeans on 30 inches. Correct. All right. Any other questions for uh, Ken on the rye soybean intercropping? If not, well, and you can think about any other questions you have in intercropping interim in the system. Bryce is going to go through uh, the pros and cons. Yeah, so after intercropping for three years and, and seeing the, as we saw through the presentations, the different variations around the around the Midwest, uh, there, there are some pros and cons that we'd like to sum up and, and let everybody know what we learned. One of the pros is workload management. In my operation, we're planting everything in March and April. Uh, then we are letting it sit till that last week of July when we finish all cultivations and things like that, that uh, we have time to go harvest that. So spreading out that workload management, spreading out the equipment management and uh, the resources. Uh, enhanced revenue potential, understanding that small grains are possible, but uh, we, we need to look at ways to enhance the revenue in the Midwest, as well as crop diversity. This is one of the important things for our, our farm, supports rotation and longevity of an organic farm. Having options, in the corn and soybean uh, rotation, there's not very many options to, to support long-term longevity, meaning I can fall seed alfalfa, or I can come back with rye and have a really good chance of success of rolling rye and soybeans. So supporting the overall goal of organic uh, intercropping or small grains has that potential. Uh, learning opportunity, I find it kind of fun to, to do different things. Uh, we always get neighbors thought, stopping by asking. I mean, it, in our pea and canola field, 
uh, about the week of June 15th, it all turned yellow. And then two days, it all, it all turned white because the peas were flowering. And so we have a, a lot of learning growth and potential in that and, and market growth in peas and canola as well. Uh, so some very good things about it. The cons, uh, learning curve from seed selection through harvest. Uh, there, there's a huge learning curve on this and, and being able to accomplish the goal of harvesting profitable crops is going to take a few years. The complex harvest logistics of getting it moved, getting it clean and separated bins, buying a cleaner uh, can be expensive and take some time, uh, as well as the equipment and overhead and the investment of that equipment. Having a drill that has two two seed boxes, having the the um, swath or the pickup head, the cleaner, the bin site, all that stuff is needed to do this in an efficient manner. Uh, also, insurability and production risk. Uh, there's not common insurance that you get for multi peril on doing this. There's a few different things that we've done. Uh, we're willing to direct you in the right path. We're not we do not sell insurance, but uh, we can direct you in the right path to that to limit production risk as much as possible. But overall, uh, intercropping, whether it's wheat and beans, it's rye and beans, it's peas and canola, it's oats and peas, barley and peas, uh, we feel like there's good potential. We have a lot more learning to do, but that's that's why we're in organic. If we, if we wanted to uh, um, not learn and, and be on the advanced cutting edge, we, we would go back to conventional and go to the spraying and cutting and, and harvest or spraying and harvesting. And so I think that's why a lot of people are here today is to do this kind of stuff and push the edge. Uh, the takeaways in cropping, the potential of benefits, details need additional development. Some of those are the seeding rates, maturity dates for improvement of harvestability. Marketing often often challenging, but critical, and I'm feeling more comfortable year by year on this. Uh, really planning is key on an operation, understanding costs, understanding logistics, understanding how this entire process moves through. Otherwise, you can get into some some real trouble doing this. Uh, opportunity to, to push the boundaries, as I just got talk, done talking about. Uh, it, it's really exciting. You know, it's fun going out there with a pickup head, a swather, doing new things, different things, uh, uh, and really pushing the limits. So with that, thank you, Bryce. We're going to open it up to uh, Q and A. Uh, so feel free to raise your hand or put in other uh, questions that you have. We have a few out there, so I'm going to start with uh, the ones from that it seemed like to be follow-ups from the rye discussion. So one was, do you think it'd work to just let the rye mature, not harvest it, and just combine the soybean? I don't know, Ken or Bryce, uh, would one of you want to take? Uh, shot in answering that? I can. Um, so I've seen people do that in conventional and in organic, and I've seen it be successful. Uh, the, the issue you're going to get is having rye in your field for a long time. So that automatically kicks you out of most small grain markets, having that much rye that's going to be volunteer coming back in your field. And I mean, you can till it all the way into May and it's still going to have rye seed. If you, you're talking about putting 30, 40 bushels of rye down, I wouldn't recommend doing that uh, just because of having that rye seed in the quantity and the amount of seed that's, that's left over. But I have seen it be successful. Bryce, I think that you kind of touched upon the next question was, can volunteer rye in a subsequent wheat crop decrease wheat value? Yes, and so that's one of the things, and even while we're hesitant to go out and roll rye and have soybeans, is we know once rye is in the field, it's, I mean, it, it's, not, it's not going to hinder yield much. It's going to pop up here and there, but on small grains, especially if you're going for food value, you're going to have volunteer wheat in there. And so you have to be really careful with rye and where you're going to put it and what's going to come three to four years, two to five years later uh in that rotation so you this year for example we had a barley we planted barley after that transition rye and we're going to feed value so there's not a huge deduction in that but if we're going to food value barley we wouldn't have a chance to get into it thanks bryce um another question we had had earlier that i'll direct to you bryce is around alfalfa 
Um, and the question was, you know, basically, what are the acres you have to reach in order to um, make the investment uh, in the right equipment to, to run alfalfa? I think it'd be interesting to also just understand a little bit about, you know, what do you do on your operation versus what do you bring in somebody to help you with? Yeah, and so I think there's two different thoughts of alfalfa here. One is raising alfalfa just for alfalfa, and one is raising alfalfa for dairy quality. If I'm raising alfalfa for uh, grinder hay or beef cattle or horses or something that doesn't require the attention or, or uh, expertise to do, you can do alfalfa at a very small level, 100, 150, 160 acres with a, a fairly cheap rake and, and cutter and, and baler. Um, and so I think that's one school of thought. If you're going to do alfalfa at scale and do it for uh, quality, what our number, my numbers are showing is no less than 500 acres of, of alfalfa, which is very significant when you talk about four cuttings on there. And raising it for dairy quality alfalfa, you need the right rake, which is expensive. We do everything wet baled. Uh, so we have a baler that bales it and wraps it all in one all in one machine, uh, not very, pretty pretty expensive. Uh, you have to have the right way to move those bales, store those bales. And so the investment in doing something like that is very significant. So two different ways to think about alfalfa and two different investments. One, I would say minimum 500 acres. The other one, 100 to 160 acres. Uh, one thing we do on our farm that uh, helps us is we do uh, hire quite a bit of the workload out to different aspects of our production. And one of those is we hire all the cutting of our alfalfa. Um, and we do that because we want to cut almost all together. So we have two or three people that cut for us. And it really reduces our workload. And we get charged anywhere from 12 to $15 an acre. We've started doing all the raking and baling as that is where the valuable part, having a good set rake not getting ash and dirt in the, the alfalfa, keeping the leaves raking at certain times is, is huge for us, um, and doing our own baling because we're wrapping wet hay. And so figuring out what you're good at, what you can do, uh, just because you're doing it yourself doesn't mean there's no cost. You still got to buy the equipment. You still got to sit in it. You still got to fix it. Still got to put fuel in it. There's cost to doing it yourself, and understanding those costs compared to what you can hire it for can really make a change on an organic operation with the entire workload that has to occur. Thank you. Ken, prior to the, the webinar, we had a question from a, a participant who registered around rolling and crimping rye before soybeans. Uh, you know, that's a concept that's widely discussed and I didn't know if you wanted to share your perspective on, on where it fits or um, how it, uh, some of the challenges and opportunities with rolling and crimping. Yeah, so from my experience and from what I've seen is that roll crimping rye is a great idea and it works wonderful if everything executes perfectly. And so some of the things that we got to think about is, is all that rye the same variety? Is it all going to senesce at the same time? Um, are you, do you get a good crimp on it on the first time? or or not because if you don't is it going to start standing back up and competing again um the timing of when you being able to get the rye in so that you're able to crimp it in the time that you want to in order to plant the beans into it there's just still a lot of variables to do it and so the success that i've seen has always been on uh basically 80 acres or less and it's taken some time and experimenting for that grower to, to really get comfortable and good at it. And so like the guys like Jamie and them, they're, they're getting more and more comfortable, but you can even tell with them that they're really stepping into it by trying it on the conventional acres. So if it gets away from them, they have some sort of remedy that they could use. But then, you know, they didn't just go right out to roll crimping it. They wanted to see how you know, make sure that they were seeing the timing of everything again for a second year. But this time they took it a step further and did it on the transition. So they got more of an idea as to what it would be like in the organic time frame. And so, you know, they're, they're going to continue to move forward and, and try and do things like that. But, you know, there's still some hesitancy. And then once you get 
too many acres like that, if some of them start to get away from you, you could end up setting yourself up for a disaster, not only that year, but, you know, long-term, as, as Bryce mentioned, you're going to add a lot of rye back into your, into your field, and that could complicate some of your other crops that you're going to have down the road. It, and just to summarize, Ken, there, I think one of the biggest relations of success we've seen uh, on rolled rye is plant it, timing, the planting time of the rye the fall before. Just a better stand, better coverage, more tillering, uh, better winter over winter. Success we've seen on our the growers' operations we've worked with. Then uh, we have a few other questions. One was around, you know, what is the average cost of organic fertilizer and what's the NPK ratio associated with that? Uh, Ken, do you want to touch upon a little bit on, on what goes into thinking about the cost of organic fer fertility um, and the fact that, you know, averages may vary significantly by region? Yeah, and so this is one of those areas where it really depends what your sources are. Are you using hog manure, cattle manure, chicken manure? Um, obviously, there's some other things like uh, SO4 and things like that, the dry fertilizers. But the main idea there is where is it located? Um, trucking cost really varies. Some things travel uh, cheaper, so it's easier to make uh, chicken and turkey manure travel further than a hog manure. Um, but if you have that as a source in your area, the nutrients vary from product to product. So, um, and then on top of that, they, they vary from site to site. And so in our area, there's probably eight different barns that we can pick from. Um, and they vary uh, anywhere in cost from 25 to $35 picked up. And so then you add in your trucking cost with that. And the the nutrient value really changes too, where it's you know it could be anywhere from 30, 30, 30 to uh, a 90, 80, 70, something like that. So you know, picking that out and making sure that you're figuring out what your nutrient your actual nutrients coming from that source is, and then picking your your uh, rate for that, and then your timing of when you buy that also varies you know you can typically find it cheaper uh in june when they have nowhere to go with manure and so if you're willing to sacrifice an acre they'll come in and, and put it down early or pile it there early so it's right there ready to go and that might benefit you getting it spread at a quicker rate winter time's a great time to also factor those types of things in um but it really varies and then picking your rotation as to when the timing is so we always put our manure on before we put our corn out there and then we don't really, we put enough to, to take care of the removal rates from that year and what the removal rates would be for our soybean crop following that. And, you know, maybe we might do something with a small grain before we go back to our small grains, we might put a little bit more out there, but it really depends on your rotation. And that's why it's really good to take the time to plan these things out and really figure out, you know, what that's going to be. We have guys that are still, that are working on their nutrient uh, plans that are two or three years out from now, that way that they can, you know, try and lock in certain quantities that they, they believe they're gonna need. Thank you, Ken. Uh, anything to add to that, Bryce or Amy? No, Ken's got a good understanding of nutrients. He worked with uh, uh, nutrient movement before, and so he has a really good understanding and, and uh, did a really good job. I, I think just to summarize it a little bit is this is one of the biggest variables of cost of production in organic. Uh, where you're located has a lot to do with what your cost of manure is. I have some fields that $60 an acre and some fields that are $250 an acre, just depending on location and where they're at. And so this is one of the most important planning aspects of what are you going to do for nutrients? what nutrients are available to you, uh, what's your rotation, and how does that all fit in? Because it's the biggest variable of cost. Well said, Bryce. And we, have, we have one final question, um, unless I missed some or others entered them in, but it was around, how do, we, how do you guys think about, and, and this might be a good one for a few people to answer, but 
uh, you know, the full-time equivalent or employees per acre uh, of an organic crop for organic crops. So if you have a mindset around, look, for every 250 acres, I need to have one full-time employee on staff or, or how do you manage or think about that? Yeah, I'll answer. I think Amy would be another good one to answer because we have two different two different operations. But this is this is a question that uh, I see vary from two schools of thought. Uh, you know, in our operation, we have so many so much different timing and crop. Uh, we're running 1,500 acres on one of our central location uh, with one person running 1.15 people running it. I'm the 0.15. My dad does most of the work uh, with timing it out and hiring a few things done. We're able to do 1500 acres with uh, one person and that that's having multiple things in the rotation, multiple timings, all spaced out, very well planned, uh, hiring a few things done. Uh, that's really pushing the limits. I think we'll probably need one more person going forward. Um, but if you're just doing corn and soybeans, I, you know, every 250 to 500 acres, you probably need an employee to, to be able to manage that much workload that's all centralized in one time uh, going through going through those, those heavy periods. Um, but having diversity, having rotation, having different crowds at different times, you can really space out that workload and equipment usage rather than trying to jam it all into two months at a time. So the only challenge that Bryce really has is, you know, his dad never gets a break from the beginning of spring through uh, through uh, Christmas. So, um, uh, uh, you know, he has to keep him happy and 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 and, and other uh, just just ma maintaining his dad's state of mind, I guess. Right, Bryce? Yeah, he's not cheap. <laughs> Amy, do you have any thoughts you'd like to share on that? Um, sure. Yeah. And this is a, it's not a one size fits all um, approach and your rotations and what you choose to internalize really dictates the number of people you need on your staff. Um, we're running, well, similar acres as Bryce, but this year we're all row crop, um, no small grains. And, um, you know, we're at that about four people. Uh, we just hired one just recently because we were pretty short um, through most of the season, but we internalize all operations and we're probably adding by choice more complexity to our operation because we're now trying to do top dressing of nutrients throughout the year while we're doing weed management and our weed management um, this year was a little bit more intensive and proactive and then we have the irrigation and we haul all of our litter um, and then we do some custom jobs as well. So I really have had to be creative to keep that type of staff busy throughout the whole year, but that's, that provides more additional, you know, ideas and, and some custom, custom thoughts, custom application as well. But yeah, I just, I'm looking at some of my line items on my budget and, you know, now this year we're trying to internalize most of our maintenance as well, um, just because our thoughts and theories is if, you know, if you can rely on yourself a lot more, um, you know, you're gonna get there in those windows that you need to hit um, to get the results you want. So I don't have to wait in line to get the service that I need because I only have to look at myself to provide that. So there's just, there's a lot of, and that's kind of with the whole philosophy on organic, that's what it makes, that's what makes it really fun. There isn't a one size fits all approach to any operation. and you can kind of just visit with several different people that are in organic and take and apply a few things from every operation to to your own and and really kind of make it make it fit what um, you know what your resources are what your goals are and your management style so it it just provides um, a lot of creativity I say in the long run but yeah our, our approach is is a little bit different but um, both ways to approach it are are seem to work for um, Bryce in our operation too so thank you Amy yep and, and so so that's it for us I think one of the things that we really want to hit home 
uh, with this webinar was, you know, the importance of, of our crop rotation uh, and thinking through that long-term rotation, again, to balance what's happening agronomically on your farm, what's happening from an economic perspective, as well as operationally, how can the right rotation help you hit upon all of those three things and get the right balance in, in line for your operation. Um, one of the things that we will be talking about, we have more webinars coming up. The next one is August 11th, where we'll focus more on corn and soybeans, as well as some other thoughts from the 2020 crop year. We hope you can make it uh, and join us for that. Uh, in the meantime, and then we'll also be running additional uh, webinars throughout the year, some more focused on farmers who are transitioning into organics and others that are more broadly applicable to uh, existing organic operations in order that we can all learn, learn together. Uh, so to wrap it up, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for the, the good questions and helping uh, push our thinking along. As Ken mentioned, feel free to follow us or we encourage you to follow us on social media. So Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram. If there's anything we can do to help your operation or you just want to learn more or meet somebody from AgroSecure, feel free to reach out to us. You can go to our website, agrosecure.com. Give us a call at the number listed here or reach out via contact at agrosecure.com. We'd love to talk with you and keep the conversation going. Again, thank you very much for your time and have a great day.